Welcome uh, to OJM's podcast series. Today's topic is going to be premium financing plans, the pros and cons of using premium financing as a tool. We've got a number of uh, disclaimers that we would like to put up and share with you here. Uh, the disclaimers that we're covering here are, are ones that you need to review and analyze uh, to make sure that when you are working with advisors, that you're working with advisors that are properly licensed and understand uh, the topics that they're covering. Also, we'll pre be presenting a number of uh, case studies, and during these case studies, you just need to understand that these are about specific examples with very specific assumptions, and that each and every assumption uh, that gets made can be changed, as well as to each uh, to everyone's specific example, uh, you'll want to look at the set of assumptions that make sense for you and your your particular situation. So these are just for purely illustrative uh, purposes. Additionally. OJM is a registered investment advisor uh, registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, we do manage money uh, for our clients, and, and therefore uh, we need to disclose that to you, let you know that uh, that is something that we do uh, do. And prior to giving any clients any specific financial uh, or investment advice, we do provide our required brochures and information to them. OJM is a multi specialty firm. Uh, we consult in a number of different areas for our clients. Uh, areas range, as you can see on the screen, from asset protection to investment planning uh, and everything in between there. We have uh, CPAs that are part of our team. We have attorneys that are part of our team. We also um, have financial planners, certified financial planners, insurance experts, and investment experts all on our team. So there are a number of different areas that we can consult with. But this topic happens to actually uh, handle trust, debt shields, uh, charitable planning, tax diversification, and the use of life insurance in those. So in this short 15-minute uh, uh, podcast that we have remaining, uh, as the managing partner at OJM Group, my job uh, is to, to really look at a number of different concepts for our clients and, and determine whether those those particular tools make sense for them. Premium financing in its basic format is the it involves the lending of money to a person or a company to cover the cost of an insurance premium. In this t podcast, we will cover the use of premium financing as it relates to paying life insurance premiums. But there are many other sources that premium finance is, in, is used for, including medical malpractice insurance, commercial lines, liability coverages. There are plenty of other insurances that you can borrow money to fund the actual premium uh, to happen. But in our, for our example today, we'll be using the concept of life insurance and how life insurance works with premium financing. The additional thing, uh, the additional basics you need to understand is in premium financing, when you're borrowing money from a lender, typically that lender is a bank, you need to first off be able to, the insured needs to be able to get life insurance and be able to go through the medical underwriting of life insurance and make sure that they can get approved at rates that are favorable from an insurance company. There is financial underwriting. We'll get into that more in a minute about what net worths need to be and what the terms and notes are going to be from the various lenders. You need to understand that there are interest rate risks as it relates to premium financing. What is the interest rate that you're going to be charged? What are the risks? What are the terms that the lender is offering for the financing uh, portion? You want to be able to have flexibility. So what are your outs if something doesn't work? And cash flow is important. And what I mean by cash flow is you've got to be able to, number one, Pay the insurance premium out of your own funds if you didn't have the financing structure available to you. That's first and foremost and most important. But number two, if cash flow changes in your business, um, you have to still have to have the ability to figure out how you're going to pay a insurance premium based on the design of the premium financing schedule. Risks. We've talked about this in, on the previous slide. You've got interest rate risks. So we're in a low interest rate environment today, which is excellent, but we know interest rates are going to eventually go back up. When is no no one really knows. 
and that's the big assumption that we have. We're, it's great now because interest rates are low, and you can lock into lower interest rates or get a, get a variable rate that's lower right now tied to LIBOR with some flexibility uh, of that rate to move upward, but only upward to a certain extent. Uh, interest rate is extremely important when you're looking at premium financing. Policy performance, so the money that you're going to be putting into the life insurance contract, what are the assumptions that we're going to use, or was the policy structured at? So how, what kind of a return has been illustrated? Is the life insurance agent that's illustrating it a, a illustrating too high of an interest rate uh, that you could return? Are they inter illustrating an appropriate interest rate? Are they stress testing the policy showing varying rates of return? Uh, in the years where potentially the rates are, are uh, rate of return in the insurance contract is low or, or zero, what does that do to the policy and the policy performance? Any change in a finance person's financial situation is a risk. So change in income is also a risk. And where what happens with the change of of your income in any of your financial situation, a divorce, you need to make sure there's a properly uh, designed exit strategy out of premium financing. What are you going to do if you get six years into this and you no longer want to have the financing portion? How are you going to get out of it? Those are important. What if you get three years into it? You need to understand all those scenarios when you're looking at it. Client, typical pri client profile, minimum net worth $5 million. More appropriate is a $10 million net worth of a client. That's something that's, that, that's at the beginning of this. If you have a $10 million net worth, Excluding your primary residence, this is more than likely uh, a tool that you could consider looking at. doesn't mean it's appropriate for you, but it's a tool you could look at. You want to be insurable. So you want to make sure that you can have uh, and get life insurance from a medical underwriting perspective. You've got to understand this is a sophisticated tool, sophisticated investors. You've got to have assets for collateral because when a bank lends you money, they're going to take a collateral assignment on the policy, cash value, and if there's a shortfall of the cash value of the policy because there's charges and expenses in the first several years, they're going to want collateral in addition to the policy. You need to be able to have collateral. Liquid collateral, meaning collateral in, in a stock portfolio, uh, they'll take real estate. They'll take other life insurance policies. You need to have adequate cash flow to pay the loan interest rate. And you absolutely have got to be able to pay the premium without financing for certain as an option. So if you can't afford to pay the premium without financing, it's not an appropriate tool for you to consider. So using some of the strategies that may benefit from leverage from using premium financing, potentially tax-free withdrawals and loans from a policy during your retirement years. That's one strategy. And we'll deep, deep dive into these three strategies, um, paying estate taxes or maximizing your charitable gifts is also another tool that is often used with premium financing. There are certainly many other tools that can be used with premium financing uh, techniques, but these are the, the three that we're actually going to cover uh, today in, in detail. I will also stress again that these are three that we're using a set of assumptions for, so um, you know, we'd encourage you to contact us directly if this is a topic that's of interest to you, and we can run a set of assumptions based on you. First, let's take a scenario where we have a husband and a wife at age 48 and 49 years of age, and the, and the specs of this are they have an annual income of $1.5 million, a $7.5 million net worth with a li liquid net worth of $5.5 million. They are currently putting 250000 at a minimum every year into their after-tax brokerage account. So they're putting that money in, and what we want to do is take a look at if we continue to make uh, uh, take some of that 250000 and actually use it to pay the loan interest of borrowing money, what would that look like in terms of distributions versus if we took that loan interest dollars and we actually allocated it to an investment account and we ran out a scenario. So you'll see the, uh, the economic analysis in a minute. But we take... Le using less than $100,000 to pay the loan interest off on an annual basis. So in the early years, the loan interest rate would be less in the, in the years as you borrow money each year, and you'll see in the analysis in a minute, in a minute the loan interest gets higher and higher. But on average, uh, over a 16-year period of time, if you're averaging roughly $100,000 a year, uh, a little bit under $100,000 a year in a loan payment, what would it look like if you took that money and 
pay the loan interest, or if you took that money and you put it into an investment account and you earned a 6.5% rate of return. Well, the projected distributions uh, on the husband or the wife, one or the other, in this scenario, we're going to look at the distributions on the husband, but on the a husband, they'd be 245000 a year for age ages 65 to 84, and on the wife, they would actually be $249,000 because the wife's younger uh, than the husband, so the cost of insurance is actually a little bit less. But let's dive into the actual spreadsheet here. Now, I want to apologize up front for this spreadsheet because it is um, a little bit difficult to, to see. But I've got a highlighter where I'm going to highlight a number of, of, of these columns as we talk about them. So what you see here is columns uh, 1 through 12, really 1 through 18. What we have over on the right side is a taxable investment account. What that means is we're going to go to a bank, a lender, and we're going to, on column 1, ask to borrow for six years, a million dollars in the first year, and then $500,000 in years two through six. So a total of $3.5 million we're going to borrow. That's our cumulative loan in column two. And our annual interest rate. The annual interest rate on this analysis is assuming a 2.2% annual re interest rate for 16-year period of time. In the 16, 17th year, we're going to pay off the loan. We're going to write a check from the cash value of the policy for $3.5 million. Now, what you need to understand is that during this 16-year stretch, there are interest payments that are due. And because you borrow a million dollars in year one and then 500 in the subsequent years, your interest payment starts to go up, 22000 in the first year, 33000 in the next year. It goes all the way up to 77000 where it remains level until you pay the loan off. So you will have paid one million, a little over $1 million in interest payments over that 16-year period of time. So we, 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 we took those same interest payments that were due and we plugged them into a taxable account. So we said over in column 13, if I took the 22 grand of interest that I was paying to finance my note and put it into an investment account, and earned a 6.5% rate of return, and I assumed that I paid long-term capital gains taxes on that growth of 23.8%, 20% long-term, 3.8% for the Affordable Care Act tax. And those of you that live in states with state income tax, you'd have to add that on. But in this scenario, we're showing that. And then I took distributions. So I paid the same $1,067,000 into an investment over a 15 16-year period of time, and I started to take distributions in column 7 out of that, I could pull 245000 out of that all the way until year 25, at which time my investment account would run out of money. I would have no more money in my investment account based on this schedule of, of dollars going in. Now, if I just pay those, that, those dollars in interest payments, I now have a life insurance co policy. The life insurance policy starts out at 18 million, 18.8 million of death benefit. And then what you'll see is the death benefit net of the loan actually starts to go down. So you'll see what the death benefit would be net of the loan and in years 8 and on you can see how the death benefit has slowly decreased down. What happens is in year 17 you'll see that the surrender value and we're assuming that we can earn 6.5% rate of return, the surrender value is $6 million, you pay the loan off, and now the surrender value of the contract is $2.8 million. So you take $3.5 million, and then we start to pull $245,000 out of the insurance contract. We're able to pull $245,000 out for 37, up till the year 37. So you you're, you can see all the way up until age 84, we're pulling out $245,000 where if you look at the other side of the equation, you can only pull money out for a eight-year period of time and not even get 245,000 out. You're going to get 1.8 million out versus 4.9 million. So look, the difference of 1.8 to 4.9 million, a three million dollar improvement. The other thing that I'll call your attention to is the internal rate of return of the cash values 
net of taxes. You can see when you get out here how how these these ta rates of return go up significantly, and really in a taxable equivalent, the IRR is 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 ten percent, double digit IRR, when you actually gross up for taxes on the insurance contract, all while having a death benefit being provided as well. So you can see just for a comparison of if I took the interest payment and I instead of paying and paid the interest due on the borrowed funds, I'm substantially better off than if I took that interest payment and put it in an after tax account, let it grow, earning a same six and a half percent rate of return. Other thing to note for certain is that no matter what, you will have uh, interest rates that will absolutely increase. So this column here, you will see interest rates will increase for sure. And we need when this is for our examples with you for this presentation. But you need to know these rates will increase, and you need to look at an increasing rate of return for certain. Let's take a look at our next example. And our next example, as I clear the field here, shows that we want to look at using this technique for paying estate taxes. So you have a husband and a wife um, that are going to that are concerned about paying their estate taxes. So we've got a fifteen point uh, two million dollar survivorship policy. And let me back up here. So the husband and wife, 72 and 68, a current net worth of $35 million. Got a projected net worth in 15 years of $55 million with an exemption in 15 years of $17 million. So you've got an estate tax projected liability of $15.2 million. So this couple is looking at using fi premium financing to pay their estate tax bill of $15.2 million. So we're looking at paying premium of $295,000 a year for 20 years. Or we have interest payments that average $119,000 or under a year in the premium financing technique. So let's take a look at the spreadsheet. In this scenario, we're going to borrow $907,000 for a six-year period of time, each of six years, and the cumulate of $5.4 million. So that's a cumulative loan. There's our interest rate that we've talked about that we know will go up for sure. But in our analysis, we're looking at what interest is due. We've got $119,000 of interest that's due. We're able to get, in the early years, a $25 million death benefit in the financing contract that then drops to $15.2 million. So you can see we've got $15.2 million of death benefit here. And with the $15.2 million of death benefit, you have that paying your estate tax. If we wanted to do the non-financing option, you're looking at $295,000 to be paid. We ran this out 18 years from now at life expectancy. And what you end up having at life expectancy is a $15.2 million policy. You've got $10 million in cash surrender value that can pay off the loan. So what you have total cash value net of the loan of 15 point or excuse me, a five point three million plus fifteen million dollars of coverage all for a cost of $2 million, assuming the interest rates stay the same, which we know it won't. But if you stress test an increase in increasing interest rate, you'd even see that, versus $6 million of out-of-pocket expense and premium that it would cost you if you went the non-traditional route. Even with an increasing interest rate, you'll, you would see that the rates would increase, um, that, that the benefit would be greater than, by using a financing, would be greater than if you didn't finance it. So that's an option if you're looking at estate planning and why estate planning sometimes makes sense. What about those clients that are charitably inclined? Well, first, they would they would need to be charitably inclined. But we have a husband and a wife that are 72 and 68 years of age. They've got $35 million of their net worth. Uh, their will currently has a million going to their 
to a public charity at their death. So a million dollar gift will provide uh, a million dollar gift at their death, obviously. A million dollar lump sum into a life insurance policy today would actually give a $3.2 million gift at death and could provide a deduction of a million bucks today. Or a million dollar gift today to a charitable remainder trust. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to get a $445,000 projected gift at their death in addition to the life insurance that we're going to fund. We're getting a $445,000 tax deduction today, and we're going to get $50,000 of annual income that the Charitable Remainder Trust is going to generate that we're going to use to pay interest on a $4.3 million life insurance policy that we're going to finance. So this $50,000 is going to go to pay for the death benefit of a financing, interest fi payment for financing $4.3 million death benefit. What the charity ends up with is a $4.8 million gift versus a million dollar gift. Let's take a look at the numbers. So what we're doing here is if we do a million dollars into an insurance contract, we know that in the early years it buys more death benefit, but in the later years the death benefit goes to $3.2 million. So we just dumped a million dollars into a life insurance policy, we'd have three a life expectancy three point two million dollars of death benefit. If we took and borrowed a million bucks a year for two years and we had to pay interest of twenty two thousand dollars and then eventually at forty four thousand dollars, that's our or fifty thousand dollar from the charitable remainder trust interest payment is coming from we can actually increase the death benefit to $4.36 million down here at life expectancy versus 3.2. So at the end, you also have that 450000 roughly 500000 You're getting $4.8 million going to your charity versus your $3.2 million. So my little drawing here got a huge difference in what's ending up going to the charity by using premium financing as a tool in a chair in conjunction with a charitable remainder trust. So that's another option as you can see uh, in terms of the three different options that we've covered uh, that are out there as it relates to premium financing. As I said, these aren't all the options that are out there. These are just three examples. And remember, there are very, you have, you have a lot of items and issues you need to think about uh, when it comes to premium financing. You need to go to an expert that knows what they're doing as it relates to premium financing. Uh, our firm would be happy to help uh, you if you have any questions. We have a uh, unique fee-based consulting firm. We have over a thousand clients in 48 states. We're multidisciplinary. We do have a firm commitment uh, for clients that qualify. Uh, any fee that we charge them will uh, show them 200% uh, of their fee and savings or we'll return their fee. That's for our clients that qualify. Certainly you can find out information about us at www.ojmgroup.com. You can also contact us at the 800 number below. We would be happy to set up a free initial consultation for you. There's no cost to that. If you want to call, we'll determine if there's a fit to work with you and for you to work with us. We'll determine if there's the firm commitment scope of our engagement and our fee that we would charge, and then we begin moving forward with the overall planning process and help you. If you want to just focus in on one topic like premium financing or insurance or you have life insurance questions or any kind of insurance questions, you can just contact our office. We'll do an initial consultation, and there won't be any charge for that to try to help you out. This is Jason O'Dell uh, from OJM Group. I certainly appreciate you taking a uh, brief time to listen to this podcast. I uh, hope you found it enjoyable, and we look forward to working with you soon.